Um, welcome to Responsible Remembering. This is a reflection on a reading group that we've been doing um, at the Reitwald Academy uh, together with Studium Generale. Thank you again, Jort, for inviting us and being here. Thank you, everybody, also at the Stadelic for having us. Thank you, Vava and Alberto and, the, um, and Dara and Noor for really uh, beautiful presentations earlier on this, af this afternoon. And next up, we have Bishak Som, and I'm really excited that Bishak can join us from New York. Um, oh, I'm putting down the thing that I need to read. One sec. <coughs> Let me know. Sorry, guys. Uh, okay. So I just I came across um, this graphic graphic novel, which really I just was blown away by it. And uh, a lot of the people in the reading group and in multiple classes that I've been reading it with, in multiple schools around the Netherlands, we've been doing this kind of like tour, as you will. Um, and uh, I'm trying, I don't have enough hands. Wait. <laughs> so this is the book that I found in the summer called Apsara Engine. Um, and let me read a bio for you. So, Bishak is an Indian-American trans femme visual artist. Her work has appeared in The New Yorker, We're Still Here, the first all-trans comics anthology, Beyond, Volume 2, The Strumpet, The Boston <coughs> Review, Black Warrior Review, Vice, The Brooklyn Rail, BuzzFeed, Ink Brick, The Huffington Post, there's a long <laughs> list here. The Graphic Canon Volume 3 and Little Nemo, Dream Another Dream. She's, um, her graphic novel, Absara Engine, that I just held up for you, that you should all go and check out, is out now from Feminist Press, and her graphic memoir, Spellbound, has been published by Street Noise Books. Um, and she's also illustrated two books about architecture, which I think sound hilarious and look really brilliant. The Prefab Bathroom, an, architect an Architectural History, um, and Cocktails and Conversations, Dialogues on Architectural Design, published in uh, by AIA New York. Okay, so how are you doing, Vishak? I would, I'm here and I'm here. I'm going to look at you like this. Okay. I'm, Welcome. I'm how just, are you? I'm, I'm just dandy. How are you? Great. Thank you for being here. Um, superimposed into Thank the screen, <laughs> and maybe I'll give you the the YouTube uh, channel, and you can tell us about your work. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah. So I'll just start my my slideshow if that's if that's yeah. okay. Um, hi everyone. I'm Bishak. Um, I was just going to maybe start off this program by taking you on a little tour through my work, somewhat in chronological order to see how um, a lot of what has gone into Upsar Engine has evolved for me through my life, um, through the twists and turns that I've taken in my so-called career um, or careers. Um, so yeah, here it is. Um, I'm calling this uh, presentation Transtopia, because um, I, I don't know, maybe I'm, that's what I've been looking for all my life and not sure if I've found it yet, but maybe we can find it together. I don't know. Um, so you can see this, yeah, it's, um, this is, uh, this is the kind of work I did when I first went to uni, um, which is, uh, I did a program in interior design um, in undergraduate school. And these are the kinds of drawings I was doing back then. Um, and I think it was really the first time I was uh, exploring notions of space, form and space through the medium of drawing. Um, I think it was pretty much the first time I was starting, you know, starting to learn perspective and how to inhabit um, spaces that were described by the perspectives with people and what it meant for people to inhabit architecture. Um, at the time I was using markers and colored pencils and stuff, um, sort of explorations in tools and techniques and materials and in 
in the perspective perspectival form um, method itself. I was also very much influenced at the time by, you know, sort of uh, architectural trends that I just discovered, which weren't new at all, but were new to me. Um, architects like Bernard Chumi and Peter Eisenman and stuff like this, and you know, all the sort of deconstructivist work that was. Um, that seemed very angry and edgy at the time to me, so I was trying to pick up on a lot of that. Um, at the same time, though, at uni, I was also doing comics, which I'd always been doing um, since I was a kid. So this is the kind of stuff I was doing. Um, I'd actually found a small group of friends who um, I was very lucky to find because we together we just... Um, we put together a, a, a magazine of comics called Strip, and we sort of nurtured each other's work. Um, and it was a very, uh, yeah, it was sort of a very healthy time for me to be around. It was the first time I'd found other people who were doing comics, and I, I got a real sort of uh, education in, in different types of um, comics that people were interested in, in making and that people were reading. So... This is the kind of, of work I was doing. Um, I was using very, um, very strange tools that, well, I mean, they're strange to me now. I was using lapidographs, which are these technical pens that um, architects used to use way back when, um, instead of brush, which is what I use now. Um, and the work itself was very kind of um, when I look back at it, at it now, I, you know, it seems very emo to me, even though, you know, I identified as a goth. So it was always very like sort of straddling that, that kind of, um, that border, I guess. Um, but you can all, already see, you know, at the time I only came out as trans fairly recently. So this early, early, early work, um, still betrays a kind of seed of that and that the characters, um, are all quite femme because I could never, I don't know, I could never really get a handle on drawing, <laughs> on drawing men and drawing, um, yeah, kind of conventional straight characters, even though some of them reappear or appear in Apsara Engine, um, as, as you may have noticed, um, but either to comic effect or as a sort of like context against which there's a sort of series of disruptions. Um, so yeah, this is some of the early work. After uni, I went to grad school to study architecture for real instead of, uh, you know, the sort of um, interior design that I was, uh, was studying, which, which I regarded as a sort of stepping stone to architecture, but really was, you know, that, that attitude seemed more... Um, evidence of, of my snobbery than anything, than any, you know, and having any basis in reality. Um, I was, I loved architecture school a lot, um, which is, is interesting because my experience in the field, as you'll find out, um, was not at all the same. But this is the kind of work I was doing then. Um, and I was really interested in a kind of texture and density to the work. Um, that I built up using models and drawings. Um, and these explorations were really uh, mind-expanding for me, you know? It's, like, made me think in a way, um, not just about architecture, but about a lot of things very laterally and diagonally and expansively. So it was a really, um, I don't know, very rich and dense time for me. You can see these explorations that I was doing back then, um, combining, you know, 3D work with 2D work um, and exploring representational strategies in architecture um, was something that I think comes up later in the comics work, but you can see the initial sort of groundwork of it here. These are the kinds of drawings I was making with pencil. Um, and, you know, starting, I was starting to find out ways of plotting points in space using uh, drawing, which maybe comes up later too, I'm not sure. Um, 
I did a semester in Cambridge in England, um, and these these are some drawings from that time. Here's a more conventional um, architectural drawing, that, you know, sort of rendered in an old fashioned way. Um, it's part of a project I was doing back then, um, investigating domestic interiors, which is something that I was really interested in and continue to be interested in, as you'll see later in some of the paintings that I've been working on. Um, I was interested in elevating and sort of valorizing the space of the domestic interior, especially with regard to um, its relationship to gender and how it's been codified by gender, but also can be exalted um, in terms of gender. So here's a little collage study I did um, as a sort of beginning of uh, trying to explore those themes. And I think uh, in my final presentation, you know, I designed this building, which I could have, um, you know, I could have just stuck with the traditional architectural representations to show the building off to the critics, right? With plans and sections and elevations and so on. But my friends um, in my studio knew that I was really into comics. So they actually sort of urged me to do a comic for my final project. And so that's what I did. I did a comic in which that there are these two characters that wander through the building that I've designed and have a sort of mini narrative that unfolds while they're wandering through the building. So uh, at the same time that they're having a discussion and talking about their lives, you're also seeing um, different aspects of the building itself. So it's like, you know, it's both a story and an architectural presentation. And I think this is the first time I attempted anything like this, although I'm much, you know, <laughs> this sort of strategy comes up again much later in my books, um, especially in, in stories like Swan Dive. But this is the first instance of that kind of thing. I'm not sure what the critics made of it. I, I thought, I, I don't think they thought much of it, but um, whatever. Um, when I came, when I um, finished architecture school, I found some of those friends from my magazine days in uni. Um, and uh, we started a small uh, comic called High Horse together, the four of us. And I started doing um, more comics for that. You can sort of see the work that I was doing at this time was becoming a little different in the sense that I was starting to use brushes. You can see that in the line work, but I was also investigating gray tones. Although these are um, digital gray tones in this um, in Photoshop, but they're also half tones. You know, they're they're different frequencies of dots making up the grays. Um, which is something, you know, I, I didn't, I stopped doing that kind of work, but I think I took away the, the idea of um, working in grays and, and exploring different tonalities of grays um, from, this, from this period in my life of, of working digitally. Um, some more work from, from this era. Eventually the, all this work was collected in a self-published book I did called Angel, which was funded by a Zarek um, I was also, yeah, as I said, I started using a brush and I kind of went crazy exploring some aspects of that, especially in how I could start, you know, investigating feathering, things like um, different hatch strokes and, um, you know, kind of spot blacks and stuff. This is the only time I did this kind of work, but I was, because uh, I moved away from it into more sort of delicate grays um, and, and watercolors and line work, but I wanted to explore what it might mean to do something darker and more kind of inky, you know? I, maybe I, I think I might try and get back to this kind of work one day. So this is, yeah, this is the kind of, this is the cover of High Horse Number 4, which I um, did the art for. And this is maybe the first time I started investigating watercolors too, and you can see already see the the sort of themes that I'm will come up later in my work, um, including um, 
very sort of femme undercurrent, undercurrents um, to the work that I left unexplored psychically back then, but would resurrect themselves later on in my life to become, you know, something much more in the forefront of my existence than it was back then. At the same time, I was also working in an architecture office, and this is the kind of, these are the kind of documents that I was producing, some of which may have very little to do with my artwork or my comics work, but I don't know. I mean, we can talk about it if you want, but I, I think doing this kind of work gave me an understanding of how buildings are put together. So maybe I took that away in the kind of, um, in the kind of architecture that shows up later in Apsara Engine and in other work. I was also doing in, in the corner, you can see a 3D rendering. Mm -hmm. I did the three models for those, not the actual rendering itself, but the model which the rendering was based on. Um, and I think doing that kind of 3D work also deepened my understanding of um, of of how to how to draw space through actually sort of building it in miniature on the computer. This is an example of that. Um, on the left, you can see my 3D model, and on the right, you can see the rendering, which is based on that model. Um, it's actually kind of fun at the time, because I really enjoyed creating these models and sort of creating these worlds in miniature. Maybe that shows up later on too, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, so I don't know. I t I, it was it was a, a decent time in my life because um, I got to do something. I sort of found this niche in my in the workspace that I was good at and I was really enjoying kind of being a sort of director of, of these um, architectural scenarios um, in the sense that I could place the camera in the computer and sort of take shots of this model um, and compose these vignettes in the same way that you do in comics, you know? Um, and I was really enjoying the kind of density and thickness of architecture at the time. Um, these are some interiors that I modeled at the time. Um, maybe some of this shows up later. I'm not sure. Mine is all the like, you know, trappings of high society. Um, around this time, I was also starting to contribute to a lot of uh, comics anthologies. Um, and I think this was about the time that I was coming out as trans. So I, a lot of the anthologies that I was contributing to were queer anthologies. This is a two-page spread from um, a book called Beyond Volume 2, which is queer science fiction and fantasy. Um, and the, this is a story about a gang of um, future South Asian trans women who um, kind of take their own, take their destiny by, into their own hands um, through magic and through dance. Um, this is another book that I contributed to called The Other Side, which was an anthology of queer paranormal romance comics. Um, and the story I wrote and drew for that was about, um, about the divine feminine and about my experience as a person of Indian origin um, who grew up in a Hindu household, venerating goddesses and what that meant to me, both as a sort of spiritual person, even though I kind of hate that word now, um, but also as a as a trans person, you know, like what it means to venerate and exalt the feminine, I think, was something that I grew up with. And then something that came roaring back to life um, in, in, uh, as my career sort of focused itself. And um, I don't know, I think that a lot of that made me the trans person that I am now, you know? So thanks, mom and dad. Um, so <laughs> here's, um, here's another anthology called We Are Still Here, which was an all trans comics anthology um, edited by my friends, Jean Thornton and Tara Avery. 
Um, I did the cover for this, as well as a story inside. Um, it's a great anthology if you ever, if you're interested in trans comics, which everyone should be. And uh, I think it's a really like I, I think it is the first showcase of its kind of all trans comics. Um, this is the story I did for it, um, which already I'm settling into this kind of um, these strategies of, um, of working in the sense of using a brush to do the line work and then using watercolors to uh, do the renderings of the, of the tones and colors, um, which is something I'm still doing to this day. Um, I was also doing larger format work for anthologies. This is also uh, a piece that explores the, the, the idea of the divine um, and of exile of, of, and of rebirth. Um, but this is um, a one-page comic, which is like 17 by 22, um, from an anthology of comics that were all this size. Uh, I also did an, uh, a contribution to this book called um, Little Nemo, which you can, you can see back there. It's a giant book, <laughs> also 17 by 22 each page. And um, this is one of the earliest um, appearances of my character, my alter ego, Anjali, who will show up in my graphic memoir, Spellbound, who represents me at a time... I, I think this is out of order a bit, but she represents, she represented me as a woman before I knew who I was, um, even though that substitution in and of itself should have signaled something to me that <laughs> something going on gender wise that I, that I had to reckon with. Um, anyway, so this, this one page story is um, a walk through um, an architectural project um, it's, it's ostensibly Anjali's thesis project. Um, and I'm drawing from my own experience here because I've had recurring nightmares about my thesis project in architecture school, which was a dismal failure. So here she is walking through this project, trying to untangle what went wrong um, during the designing of it. And she's also encountering ghosts of her, of her own past. Um, before waking up, which is the sort of strategy of the book in which this character, Little Nemo, goes to bed, goes through this adventure all in the course of one page and then wakes up at the end, um, usually falling out of bed. But I've substituted Anjali instead of Nemo and she is representing or dredging up my own psychic history here. I, um, at the same time that I was starting to explore watercolors in comics, I was also exploring watercolors in standalone paintings, which is something I've been doing even now, like especially in 2020 during the pandemic, it's sort of a refuge for me. But I was also using that, um, these, using these watercolors to explore, again, aspects of, of Hinduism and of, of divinity. So I did a series of paintings of goddesses of aspects of um, of the divine. So this is um, Saraswati, who's the goddess of learning, uh, of knowledge, and music. And also, I consider her to be the goddess of the arts. So she's very she's someone very dear to me. Um, and yeah, these are explorations in architecture, and also the idea. And again, I sort of have been working looking at the idea of exile a lot in my work. Um, I'll talk about that a little later with some more recent projects. Um, but these are the kinds of paintings I was doing at the time. Um, exploring sort of architectural fantasies and, and how people and pigs <laughs> might inhabit them. <laughs> Um, I think uh, by this time I'd come out. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'll leave you to um, interpret that however you wish. Um, but uh, you can see 
all these characters, these femme characters are like, are now dominating the, the screen and the uh, paintings. And, you know, they seem to have taken over worlds that I was interested in, um, in depicting. So, um, Jay, you mentioned this book that I did. Um, I, I touch on it very briefly because it was actually kind of a dream job. It was supposed to be a very conventional architectural job, and I was supposed to be just doing drawings in AutoCAD. But again, when my boss found out that I did these watercolors, she said, you know, I've wanted to do this book for a long time. What would you think about working with me on it? And I said, sure. So I ended up doing these watercolor renderings of um, of architects and their projects um, based on conversations that they would have at the Center for Architecture in New York with journalists um, about their work. And then sometimes th there would be a cocktail afterwards that a mixologist would devise uh, inspired by the work of, or ostensibly inspired by the work of the architect. So this is the kind of stuff I was doing for that, for this book, which was kind of a dream job, right? It's like, um, this is what I got paid to do. And I loved it because I loved some of the work that I was depicting, you know, uh, Liebeskin's work especially is something that I've always found inspiring. So to be able to represent it was really, um, really special for me. Yeah, you can see the cocktail recipe that goes along with, with Mr. Liebeskin's work. Um, yeah, it was, uh, I'm sad that, that, that I don't no longer get paid to do this. Um, but what I took away from all of that work was a renewed interest in, in depictions of architecture and especially the, the role of color in, in maybe suffusing um in describing forms but in suffusing them with a kind of you know i was talking earlier about texture and density and that doesn't only have to come from form but i thought it comes from my maybe it also comes from color and um uh, and surfaces you know overlapping surfaces and i've i think i've sort of re uh invigorated an interest in in the surface recently which i'm always uh happy to continue to explore. Um, at the same time, also, you can see um, my burgeoning interest in maps and cartography, and that comes up later in Swan Dive, as, as I think you all know. But also the idea of, as ma of maps as landscape and of maps as um, not just sort of flat documents, but um, as entities that is, exist on a spectrum from three dimensions to two and back between our landscape and between architecture and what that means to inhabit these kinds of hybrid spaces. Um, you can see what I would man, mean about like um, color and surface being a way to investigate uh, density and, and texture, and especially in this piece. Oh yeah, I should mention these pieces that I was doing were actually part of a exhibition that um, happened in 2018 in Helmond in, uh, in the Netherlands. So I got to come and visit you all. Not, not that I know you all um, specifically, but I got to visit um, your beautiful country um, and, and to hang out in Helmond which has a very interesting museum of antique computers and arcade games. So if you all go there, you should check that place out. It's very funny. Um, I quit architecture and took some time off to focus on art and comics. And this is what happened. Uh, finally, in 2020, these two books came out, Upsar Engine, which you've all read, I think, and Spellbound, which is a graphic memoir, which I was doing after I finished the initial manuscript for Upsara Engine, I didn't know what to do with myself. So I started doing these diary comics, which as a genre, I was not interested in, but I thought I should try them because I'd been reading some and I thought I'll, 
obviously I can do this much better. Right? <laughs> but, <with French. laughs> um, I didn't want to draw myself, so I created this alter ego, this character called Anjali, who is a cisgender woman. Um, again, this is slightly before I came out, but you can, you know, that, that as I was saying, the substitution um, should have signaled something much more relevant than, uh, than I realized, right? Um, it's become a lot more kind of tangled as, as the years have gone on, but um, it's, uh, I don't know, it's, it was a nice prelude to my, um, to realizing who I, who I am and, and would become. Seem these are some of the originals from Spellbound, which I did um, uh, in ink. And then I scanned and did the colors digitally. Um, you can see some of the tools I use to, to do these, to do some of most of my comics. Um, the book was exploring a lot of themes of queerness, even though I didn't know I was queer at the time. Whatever, I don't, I don't understand myself um, sometimes, but I don't, I don't know what to say about that uh, other than I'm a very late bloomer. Um, I was exploring a lot of my childhood also through this book, um, and especially, um, you know, our, um, our frequent trips to India when I was a kid, which um, informed a lot of my interest in travel uh, and, and maps and, and in between spaces, um, which I think comes up later in the work. And of course, um, Apsara Engine, which after many rejections finally got, um, embraced by the feminist press. Um, I won't say too much more about it because I think most of you have read it, so we can talk about it in detail if you want. Um, these, a lot of these stories were done actually quite a while ago and were collected um, into Apsara Engine as a collection, but only began to cohere once the book got picked up by Feminist Press. Um, and you know, so you can see some of the interest I had in, in architectural representation from my work at uni and in grad school coming back again and now you know, and my interest in, in injecting narrative into these drawings coming back in, in my later work. Um, and of course, the, the interest in cartography, which finds its fullest uh, form in the story Swan Dive. So I was just gonna end with some of the work I've been doing recently, uh, especially since March, 2020, when, when the world went dark. Um, so I, re I returned to doing small nine by nine, 10 by 10 paintings, exploring themes of feminist and architecture movement and dance um, and sort of, you know, um, exploring ideas of what it means to be kinetic within within architecture um, and within hybrid forms of architecture. I was also looking at some floral motifs for some reason and, and sort of um, textures, um, again, because I had an interest in surfaces and patterns. Um, not sure where that's going, but I, um, I wanted to see what it would be like to, to just go fully into that rather than to apply it to architecture. Um, but I was also, again, you know, looking at domestic interiors and, and ways of inhabiting um, these spaces that I created, um, issues of scale and of, of inhabiting architecture at different scales. And there's always this abiding interest in a sort of fantasy of architecture, you know, um, drawn from my early, early interest in the deconstructivists and people like Labius Woods and the um, work of uh, um, Austrian and German and, and European architects. 
specifically. Um, here's a, another, you know, a domestic interior, which I touched on. You, I think earlier collage from Cambridge was a kitchen. This is also a kitchen um, based on the Frankfurt kitchen designed by Margarete Schutelhurtsky in, I think, 1920-something. I forgot. But um, I've taken that interior and sort of um, choreographed a little um, narrative, a little dance within it. Uh, <clears throat> This is some. Uh, this is one of the more recent works I've done, um, inspired by the work of Kurt Schwitters and his Mer Mer Merzbau um, projects, uh, which I love. And you know, there's so little documentation of those projects that I wanted to kind of take that spirit and uh, move it forward in time, mm -hmm. and to have people interacting with that kind of explosive energy. Finally. Um, these are some of the comics I've been working on um, in 2020-21. This is a piece that came out in the Georgia Review, uh, which is a, an academic journal. Um, three comics people were assigned to do pieces all called Shelter in Place, and that was the theme of the story. And then, so this, this piece explores what it means to um, have one's shelter go along with one as one is traveling through the world. So it's a mobile shelter that this, this traveler is bringing with them. Um, and again, it's exploring ideas of exile, you know? Um, this is the most recent piece. Uh, these are obviously just the pencils. But, um, it's a piece called The Tourist, which will come out on eFlux magazine, which is an online publication. Um, exploring again ideas about exile, but also exploring what it means to be part of a trans community um, for good and for bad. Um, what it means to try to inhabit utopia and uh, the pitfalls of trying to find that kind of utopia. And I'm gonna end it there because that's all I got with Thanks for, thanks for looking at these images um, with me. And I hope that made some kind of narrative sense. I, I sense a lot of uh, things have evolved um, along certain trajectories, but I don't know. We can talk about that if you like. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much. You're welcome. Woo! Thank you. Thank you. Stop it. <laughs> yeah, there's a, there's a lot of love in this room. Everyone's very, Aww, very like really that's so sweet. Yeah, really beautiful work all the way through. And that's really interesting Thank to you. see for the first time how lots of different parts of what you've been doing um loop around and kind of like wormhole into each other. Um Yeah. I you mentioned uh, yeah, you mentioned exile several times. Uh -huh. And I'm wondering mm -hmm. about some of the characters some of the characters you have who, um, what was I thinking of? I was thinking of actually like some of the characters who seek exile or take exile and about the difference between the conditions that they find themselves to be in versus a kind of a very maybe stereotypical or flat idea of them being forced or pushed or pulled in a really simple narrative. Some of the people that... Um, seek exile in your stories have really got um it's a decision that's made in relation mm -hmm. to parts of society let's say yes um and it's not uh, necessarily an easy one but it's yeah i wonder if you can talk about exile in general then in relation to the way that your different characters also pursue it or need it i think um well, I'm thinking of the story that I did for the queer paranormal uh, anthology in which the main character becomes very disillusioned with um, her place in society, but specifically with her relationship to a kind of urbanism, right? I, the story starts off in an unnamed city, but it's clearly, you know, like an a Indian metropolis. And the kinds of quotidian experiences that she goes, um, that she encounters 
on her trips to the grocery store or to the market suddenly fill her with a kind of, um, I don't know, she senses an emptiness mm. that pervades like not only the people that she encounters, but is beginning to infiltrate her. And she that's something she wants to keep at bay because she's always been a sort of um, pious, or I don't want to say pious, uh, a, a, a devotee, you know? And she thinks that somehow at this time, in her, and she's an older woman, uh, as she thinks it's the time has come for her to renounce her place in society and to fulfill her um, her role as as a daughter of of the divine feminine. Mm -hmm. um, and in a way, I sort of see it as a laying the groundwork for my own exile at some point. <laughs> That. I don't know what that means, but I, I think about it a lot, you know, and I, I, I think about it because I am very misanthropic, you know, um, I kind of get very angry. Uh, even before this pandemic, I was like, you know, just walking on the street or like going on the subway, I would get very upset with people for just being horrible. <laughs> and, uh, and, but that's, you know, it's like, that's, but people were just living their lives and I couldn't seem to stop being upset with them for doing that um, because of the way of the unthinking ways that they were living their lives. I think a lot of this comes up in, um, in uh, Mina Anaparna, the story yeah. where um, Mina starts ranting about exactly this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that is the groundwork for, for, um, this interest in in exile mm -hmm. and thinking what it means to to pull away from that. Mm -hmm. But I was just thinking because uh, my images of like the hermit or other kinds of mm. um, wandering, uh, I don't know, people who are like yeah. uh, taking care of some sort of spiritual duties and have this kind of grandiose position that we're supposed to revere have historically been men for me men like yes the story mm -hmm. that i've been told and yes and because i think that a lot of the people that keep everyone together in my family have been women and don't really get to afford to think about where they're at exactly are, exactly so no one's that's <laughs> i mean it is it's a very selfish thing to suddenly i mean renounce it one's one's place in the world but that's why a lot of the characters who do to undertake this project of exile in my stories are themselves already cut off. Mm. You know, they have no ties. Mm -hmm. um, I think maybe that's comes from my own experience because my, uh, I mean, I have my chosen family here, but yes. uh, my, so my biological family, um, or the extended version of that is still in India, but there are people that, I don't talk to that often mm -hmm. and my, you know, the kind of blood, the sense of blood family that I have now here is completely evaporated. So I think I've already set myself on the path towards a kind of, um, to becoming a, something. <laughs> well, you've got your futuristic tent ready, pack it. You've got it's That's packed. exactly right. Yeah. So I'm going to pack and you know, all like the birds and animals that are going to come with you. And oh god, I have still have to do a bit of research on that front. But yeah, yeah, yeah. that's that's yeah. Yeah, I'm thinking thinking about like maybe the hermit or other characters. Um, uh -huh. I noticed like re reoccurring um characters oh. and dress. Um, I'm thinking about the relationship maybe between the dress. Like, dress that yeah people the the, the uh -huh. between uh, cherubs. Um, Apsara <laughs> and business uh, casual, and also regal. <laughs> so there are there what are lots the of like, So what? What was the last one? Regal, like like queen. Oh, regal, regal. Yeah, there yeah. are lots of the like like, and sometimes the queen has gone on like the queen the queen of the court has gone on holiday from her futuristic tent. Um, or on exile. Yeah, she's already in exile, but then she goes on holiday. <laughs> she goes on holiday from exile. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> Um, um, so I'm just thinking about the ways that, yeah, I'm thinking about lots of these different characters who uh -huh. um, have different, um, create different spaces for themselves and then yeah. different kind of personas. 
uh, so that you can like tighten like business casual I think is a really interesting place where some of the, ca the characters and then all the clothes come off and they're all like draping around and dancing in the next scene or something <laughs> is there a business casual I don't I don't I think remember in some, yeah in some of your images there's like suits and very like like no really I, okay. I thought okay. I saw some. I mean, just, <laughs> yeah, I remember on balconies, like talking, like as if they might have a coffee in between, like uh, drafting some report or something. Oh, good God! Okay, I'll have to <laughs> re investigate that. <laughs> no idea. Okay, um, we also have a question uh, from the chat. Oh, okay. yeah. um, so Leo was saying hi, Bishak. It's nice to get some hi, Leo. work. Um, I'd like hey, hey. to ask about your exploration of building narrative in comic, in the comic, how do you, how does the text and the image meet? How do you bring the text and image together to tell these stories? How does narration work? Ooh. Um, it's different for different stories, right? Um, mm -hmm. For example, in stories like the first one, which is Come Back to Me, and then there's another one, Love Song. Mm -hmm that image and text are either um, aligning or syncing at some points, but the, the kind of mystery and enigma of those stories comes between from the gap yeah. between the two things, right? So mm -hmm. to me, for example, I think that the text and the image are going sort of parallel like this for a while, and then all of a sudden text goes off like this, an image goes off like that. Yeah. And then here is where the sort of interest of the comic lies, because you don't know why there is a chasm between the two things, right? Yeah. And that I was really interested in exploring, because that is the sort of skeleton of comics, right? Mm -hmm. That's what comics are based on, that, that juxtaposition. So I was interested in seeing what happens when the two, the, the image and text get divorced from each other and... Go, go their own ways, you know, what does that mean? Um, there are other stories which are more conventional in the sense that image and text are, are nicely, you know, wedded and they're going, they're sort of helping each other move the text along mm -hmm. or the narrative along. Um, but then sometimes like in Swan Dive, right, the, the text just kind of either drops out completely or it starts stuttering yeah. or it's, it becomes a sort of like incantation or a chant or something. Mm. The sort of di the conventional dialogue and sort of conventional filmic quality of the earlier scenes in which, you know, one character says something and you see the other character from over their shoulders and they're having a yeah. dialogue which has come out of a script mm -hmm. because out of a script, all of that kind of gets, exploded by the time the two characters start creating this other world and it becomes a world of a, kaleid a kind of kaleidoscopic visual world but also one in which the text has become fragments because it's mm -hmm. been edited and it, that's superimposed and becomes part of this kaleidoscope. Mm -hmm. I you know? interpreted that section as like when the, the way that the characters start to communicate language operates differently because mm -hmm. the, there's some mm -hmm. sort of eternal... Yeah. A relationship that they're recalling exactly. all the time, yes. making new yes. again in different yeah. spaces. Yes. So they yes. they go through time and they see each other in time in so many different ways. Yeah. So their language yes. bubbles pop up in really beautiful ways. They've already heard Thank each you. other say so many things. Yes. Yeah. It's, oh, you uh, you've got my number. <laughs> <laughs> well, That's also, exactly it. <laughs> yeah. But we've been talking about the ways in the group, yeah, that all of the ways that time and space, and what is beautiful about it is that even within the box of the frame of the image, the um, starts to bleed, and in something like Swan Dive, the lines, what we perceive might be as uh, break lines between each frame, then become yeah. roots or roads or ways to yes. up into yeah. those spaces as well. It's really beautiful. Um, I'm oh getting some signals from the back of the room, unfortunately. We're what? running out of time. And what? That's I, it? It's gone so quickly. No. I don't understand where no. it's going. <laughs> no. But um, I, I refuse hope that to we leave. can continue this conversation another time. And um, I, there will be other opportunities for you to come back to the Netherlands, either real. Oh, God, yes, please. Yeah. yeah. Can, and, can uh, we go to the Tweets Vantjes? Uh, yeah, for sure. 
<laughs> I, wa I want to sing. Yes, come and sing with us. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, we're going to love coming. you. Pardon? Okay. I was going to ask the, the, the whole crew to come to for singing. Yes, everyone's invited. It's official and, and everybody in the chat is invited too. Okay. Okay. Thank you All so right. much, Bishak. We love you and leave you. Um, uh, yeah, good luck with your next um, injections and stay safe. Thank you. Okay. You Bye. too. You too. Bye. 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 Okay. <laughs> Bye.